How's it going, church? Good. Um, I was thinking about uh, the other day that uh, I've been doing counseling now for about 11 years as a pastor, and I've never had anyone, anyone, not even one person come to me and say, Pastor, I have a good life. Would you help me have a bad life? (laughs) Right? I have a good life. Would you help me have a mediocre life? All of us... uh, Either we realize it or not, we are in this pursuit of greatness. Uh, Maybe we never stopped and, you know, thought about it, but we're all in this pursuit of greatness. We all want to have great lives. We want to have great families. We want to have great jobs, right? We want to have great vacations and our kids, we want our kids to be great and look great. We want to look great. We want to have a great style, great hair, right? Every time my my wife gets a haircut, she's like... Did you notice anything different? <laughs> and being married for 15 years, it's uh, most of the time is the hair. And you go like, oh, your hair looks great. And so we're all like in this pursuit of greatness. Do you guys agree with me? We're all, again, we, maybe we don't think about that. We want to we wanna have a great car. We always, we always say stuff like this. My dream car would be my dream job. Right? What is it saying? We are in the pursuit of greatness. Correct? And so growing up, I remember, I was about 14, 15, maybe 16, you know. I remember that my family's description of greatness was so different than my description of greatness. And so my family used to be not just my mom and my dad, but the whole extended family. They gave a lot of, like, emphasis on, on, you know, money and status. And so they would say things like this, wow, did you hear your cousin's doing great? See the pursuit of greatness? See, she's doing great. She not only went to the, one of the best schools in the nation, now she got a great job. Look at the great and greatness. She's got a great job and she's doing great. And little by little, I'm, I'm like, I'm puzzling, you know, this thing, this greatness thing, 14, 15, 16. And I realized all they were talking about was money. And uh, to, to the point that I went, I went back home for Christmas, and we're all there, the whole family's there. And we go to, always go to my uncle's ranch, and everyone's having fun, and everyone's doing things, you know, barbecue, and the whole playing soccer, and playing games, and after the dessert, we're all so full, you know, Brazilian barbecue, so after you eat like, you know, 20 pounds of meat, what do you do, you play dominoes, right, you can't, you can't play soccer after barbecue, and, and, and then the dominoes will break out, and then playing cards, and I remember looking at my, at this cousin that was doing great, because she was older than me, and she was behind the laptop all day long, and I remember thinking about, like, I don't want to be that great. That's not my definition of great. Are you following me, church? We're all in the pursuit of greatness, but our description and our definition of greatness is different, correct? My definition was like, Mom, I'm not after this. I'm not after, really, everyone's having fun and she's behind the laptop. There was a point in our gathering. Again, we spent two nights there at the ranch. We sleep, you know, everybody's sleeping on the, on the living room, and it's kind of fun and stuff like that. But I remember the first day that I'm there, I'm just observing her because she's doing great, right? I'm a 14, 15-year-old. I want to I learn what great looks like. And so at one point, there was this one kid. She's walking around, maybe a one and a half. She's one and a half uh, years old. And, and I, I couldn't decipher who's the mom. Because this one-year-old was like maybe in this lady's lap on a moment, one moment, this other lady's lap at one moment, maybe my mom's lap. I'm like, after like four hours of noticing this, I'm like, Mom, whose kid is that one? Because I hadn't been home for like four years or so. Oh, that's, that's, that's your cousin, that, that, that one that's doing great. And I'm like, no, I protest your definition of greatness. She's just working out all day. She didn't have any fun, and she didn't hold on to her baby this whole time. I protest. My definition of greatness is the correct one. Isn't that what we all think? That our greatness is the correct one? And so my definition of greatness was like, no, mom, it's not about being behind a computer all day, making tons of money, and just selling your life to corporate America. It's nothing like that. It's about traveling the world. It's about surfing the best ways, mom. 
It's about eating great food, going to great places, and meeting great people. See the great? The pursuit of greatness? Great, great, great. And then surfing great waves and, and eating the greatest fruits in the planet and taking great naps after surfing. <laughs> See, my, my definition of greatness was more like enjoying life. Not so much in the status and not so much on the, the money and the car that's going to show off. And, and the, the apostles, at one point, they come to Jesus and they had the same question. They come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? And we're all in that same, we're all doing the same thing. We're, we're living life in such a way because we believe that way is the greatest. It's going to give us the greatest joy and the greatest happiness and the greatest fulfillment to the point that Jesus is, it's the last supper now. Jesus is just saying, hey, this is going to be the last day that we're eating together as a family. And during that time, they're like, the apostles were looking at each other and they're like, now it's the time to ask. Jesus, who's the greatest? And that's what we're going to be reading because Jesus will be teaching us what is greatest, what is greatness according to God. Let's open the Bibles in Luke 22. What is greatness? What is God's definition of greatness? Not my definition. Know your definition because I can guarantee we kind of pursue the same things uh, about, but I can guarantee we can have like, I don't know, if there's 90 people here right now, there's 90 definitions of greatness. But what is God's definition of greatness? So in Luke 22, starting in verse 24, it says as follows. A dispute arose among them, the apostles. You know, this is the, the last supper. Remember this, they're, you know, the last time with Jesus. And they asked, they were, and they asked, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Now there's a di dispute. Who's the greatest, Jesus? Maybe Peter was like, uh, it's me, of course, right? Remember Jesus? I walked on water. Remember, we went surfing without a surfboard? <laughs> Nobody had the guts to step out, right? Who did it? Maybe John was like, no, Jesus, remember, I was the most loving. I am the disciple who you loved. Remember, I used to lean against your chest and, and just be so loving and affectionate to you. Remember? And so they're all like, since this is the last meeting, who's the greatest? And then Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. So he's just starting to explain, in this world, in the world that we live in, there is this hierarchy thing. The managers, they exercise authority over the people. And the directors, they exercise authority over the managers. The CEOs and CFOs exercise authority over. That's how the world works. Right? That's what Jesus is explaining. That's how the world works. But you're not to be like that in verse 26. Instead, the greatest. Now, he's explaining who's the greatest. The greatest among you should be like the youngest. And the one who rules like the one who serves. For who's greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? You know, now he's saying, you know, they had housekeepers and housemates and servants in the house. And so Jesus is explaining, who's the greatest? The one who's sitting on the table being served or the, the people that are serving the owner of the house? Who's the greatest? Of course, it's the owner of the house. It is not the one who is at the table. But I am among you as the one who serves. And so Jesus is pretty much bringing the whole uh, authority upside down. And then we continue in John 13 because he's explaining the same thing in the book of John chapter 13. It's, it's also describing the Last Supper and it's also describing this very moment. And what Jesus, after he explains it, so we're going to see a progression. He explains it. Hey, the, my authority 
Greatness according to me is not like the great, uh, greatness according to the world. It's not according to like you guys define it. I define it a little different. And in verse 5 of John 13, he says, after that, after that explanation, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that it was wrapped around him. In verse 12, for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to skip a couple of verses. His, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You called me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. Yes, I really am the teacher. I really am the Lord. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example. Repeat after me, example. Je repeat after me, Jesus is setting an example. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sends him. Now that you know these things, now I, I, I shared some information with you. I shared what greatness is in the kingdom of God. Now that you know these things, I set you the example. He went down on his knees and washed the disciples' feet. So he not just only taught for the mind, he also taught for the eyes. He gave him an example, and then he concludes with the, with the slum dunk. And he says in verse 17, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Repeat after me, you will be blessed if you do it. Louder church, now we're going to say I. I will be blessed if I do it. Now, what is Jesus saying right here? The true definition of greatness is this revolutionary teaching. That is, greatness is found in humility. Wow. So different than what we think, correct? That greatness is found in serving people. Because we serve God by serving people. How can you serve an invisible God, church? We serve God by serving people. So greatness is found in, in humility by serving the people around us. You know what's a bummer about this passage? Is that my, my family's definition of greatness was wrong. And my definition of greatness was also wrong. And your definition of greatness is also wrong. Jesus said, you want to be great in my eyes. You want to do great. Don't go by what Uncle Bob and Billy and Susie says. Go by what I say that greatness is. And it doesn't matter what car you drive, what car you don't drive, how old is your bicycle, how, how the, is the bus, how crowded is the bus. You get. It has nothing to do with possessions. It has nothing to do with things. It has nothing to do with places we visit. You know, on Facebook, you can pinpoint all the places you've been, right? We like to brag about the stuff we have, right? We see Facebook postings like, Oh, I hate doing luggage. You know, I hate packing up for traveling. Because, yeah, I'm traveling the world in the next 20 days. <laughs> Take that. You. You're going to work. And I'm going to travel. And then you can always put the places you've been in the globe, right? And then you come back, you put another place in the globe, and bam, Facebookers. <laughs> I'm doing great just went to China and India, ate some spicy food that went right through me. <laughs> but greatness has nothing to do with any of that. We are all wrong. 
What is the greatness that you're pursuing? Let's be honest. What is that? Think about. Does it have to do with humility and serving others? No, it's quite the opposite, right? It's about us, and it's about shoving in people's faces our victories. Look at my diploma. Diplomas are growing bigger. Now, I visit some offices. They're, pretty soon, they're going to be the size of this, this projector right here. <laughs> you get in the office, like, bam! It has nothing to do with that. You see, and, and, and the beauty about this passage, it doesn't mean if you graduated high school or not, or if you have a doctor's degree or not. We all can be great in God's eyes. Isn't this beautiful, church? Because now in God's definition of greatness, it has to do with humility and servanthood. Wow. It has to do with not us being in the spotlight, but God being the spotlight. You know what I'm saying? We love to be in the spotlight. Let's be honest. But Jesus is like, no, 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 greatest is different. The way I see the greatest is different. The greatest one are the ones who serve the most. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. So why God wants us to know this information now? So far, I'm talking to the head. Why? Because if we don't know this information, uh, we can be pursuing the wrong greatness. I think this message is for all of us. It doesn't matter who you are. This is a message that, remember the old GPS? The old GPS, they don't do it nowadays. But when you got lost, the lady used to say, recalibrating, recalibrating, recalculating. Like meaning, you just got lost. I'm going to have to fix the route. This message is for us because we get lost and, we, and then we start pursuing this greatness that is maybe a diploma, maybe it's a bigger house, maybe it's a bigger car. And then what we do is we spend a lot of time and we spend a lot of energy, we spend a lot of brain power, time, we, spend, we put a lot of effort in, into pursuing something that is not that great in God's eyes. Are you following me, church? And so that's the first reason why God wants us to know. Because if we don't know what greatness is in his eyes, we can be easily be pursuing the wrong greatness and the wrong great things. And the second thing is that verse, the last verse that we read. You know, verse 17, it says, I, if you do these things, you're going to be blessed. I, I, I want you guys to be blessed, Jesus is saying. I want you guys to be happy. I want you guys to really find fulfillment. I really want you guys to find joy. I really want you guys to have this awesome, full life, abundant life, overflowing life. I really do, but it's found in a different place. It's found on your knees by serving people. By serving and loving the people around you. It's in the last place that we picture, right? I thought it was going to be in Bali. I thought it was going to be in the barrels of Mentawai. <laughs> GoPro, right? Got to go pro the moment to put it on Facebook and bam, the world. I got the barrel and you didn't. <laughs> But that barrel's going to end. After two hours, my, I got noodle arms. That's what we call the surface. The arms, they, they, they can't move anymore. They go like, you, you know, you're patterning like this. I'm doing great. I'm still patterning. I'm still feeling like 18. Not. <laughs> so God is bringing this message to us. Why? Because he doesn't want to waste our, our lives and waste our salvation in things that are not priority. They're not that great. You know that prince died and you know how much he left? Everything. Everything. All his diplomas, all his uh, everything. All his, I don't know, Golden Globes and Emmy Awards and whatever those things are called. And so God is talking about an eternal reality right here. God is talking about something that will last forever. 
And he tells us that not even a cup of water that you give in my name will be forgotten in eternity. Even if you bring and serve somebody a cup of water in Jesus' name because you want to serve God by serving people, you want to be a blessing to others, not even a glass of water will be forgotten. So that's why God wants us to know that. And how can we make this teaching practical? How can we make this thing practical that we can get out of here today and start using it today and using it for the rest of our lives? First of all, recalibrate greatness. And it's going to be an endless battle because the flesh, my flesh, will always think it's in, in the islands of Mentawai and in the barrels of the world and eating crazy good food and meeting awesome people around the globe. My, my flesh will never become a Christian and your flesh will never be a Christian. That's why there's the whole battle against the flesh and the spirit. You're always going to go back to your worldly definition of greatness. And so it's going to be an endless battle while we're in this side of heaven. But I hope today on we just go back to God's definition of greatness. And the definition of greatness that he's giving that you're not better than anybody. And you're not greater than anybody. You can have 20 employees, 200 employees, 2,000 employees. God placed you there to love on these people and serve those people. You may be a manager, a director. You may be there in that position and have all the seniority and the best schedule. You're not better than the janitor. You're not better than the trash lady. You're not better than any of those people. You're there to love those people and serve those people. And, and, and we can do this today. As we go grab our burritos and hang out with the family, as we're going to go barbecue, we're not going to sit at the table and go, like, right, come on, serve me. We can go back to our families today and we can serve our spouse and we can serve our kids and we can serve our neighbors and we can go, can, can go back Monday to school and to our workplace and love on those people. Are you following me, church? Amen. That changes the mindset. It changes everything because we're there most of the time. We go to work for the paycheck. We go for the promotion. We go for the status and for more money. And God's like, no, no, no. Missed the point. Recalculating. Recalculating. Recalibrating. Do I sound like a good GPS at all? That sounds kind of creepy, right? I sound like a robot. Now, I was watching this documentary on the owner of Costco. I don't know if he's a Christian because it doesn't say in the documentary, but I think he is. Because they said, what is Costco about? You know what his answer was? I thought it was going to be like great product. It's going to be great customer service. It's going to be great this. He says, it's about my employees. Costco is about employing the American people. I am going to give the best job that I can give. And I'm going to give the best benefits that I can give. Because Costco is about my employees. It's about the people. How I'm going to do this? By selling great stuff so people can come back, so I can give the best jobs that I can give. And I hope Costco blows up and we have a million stores so that I can employ more and more people. And, and he didn't even say bless because, again, it's a secular documentary. He says, and give jobs to more and more families. Isn't this beautiful? He capped his salary of $400,000 per year. Sounds like a lot. It's not a lot. About $30,000 per month. He could have been making $10 million a month, right? He's the owner of Costco. Come on. He capped his salary of $400,000. I said, I don't need any more of that. I stopped at that because, again, it's not about me and it's not about my comfort. It's not about my glory. It's about my employees and it's about helping and blessing these families. Wow. What a lesson. That if you become a manager, it's not for you to exercise authority over anyone. You do this. <laughs> wow, I do nothing. No, the question is, the, the, the triangle, the, the pyramid of the world is like this. This is authority. The authority in Jesus' definition, is a, it's upside down. The more you go up, the more you go down. The more you go up, more people we should serve. Are you following me, church? And so, 
God's so good. We don't go after titles, and we don't go after promotions, church. We, that's, that's God's work. We're going to do our best. We're going to apply for those better jobs, and we're going to interview for those better positions, and we're going to do our part. But that's all in God's hands. Our job, the thing that we can do tomorrow, and every day after that, we can go not for the titles, and not for the money, and not for the authority. We can go for some feet starting tomorrow. Wow. Uh, our flesh hates this message. <laughs> right? Really, Pastor, I came to the church for you to tell me that I'm getting a promotion tomorrow. And you're giving me some stinky feet? <laughs> and you're telling me to serve? Really? Yeah, what about tomorrow when you go back to work or school, wherever you go, and you just go and you know that you're there to serve? You can serve a smile to someone. You can serve an encouragement to someone. Maybe you're right there at the printer and you see copies coming out and you go like, oh, Susie, just bring those stuff out. Hey, Susie, I, bring, I brought this to you, you know. Wash some feet and serve some people. Hey, I'm going to lunch. Anyone who wants anything, I'm not paying for anybody because I don't, but I can bring some stuff to you. If you have enough to pay, you pay for them, okay. Um, I was just trying to throw it out there that you don't have to pay for everyone. You may work in a big office. You are there to serve these people. So I want you to stop and think right now. As you get out of here, you go back home to your families. How, how are you serving? Are you being a great spouse, a great parent? According to God? Are you being a great employee? Not because you know, really know how to brown nose the big people so that you can get the next promotion. Are you a great employee in God's eyes? Are you washing? Are you serving people there? Are you loving on them? I pray that all of us will be changed by this message. That all of us will get out of this place. Are you, are you serving your church? Are you serving your neighbors? It's the greatest in God's eyes, is the one who serves the most. So it's all about loving God and serving God by serving people because God is an invisible God. How can we serve God? We serve God by, by serving one another. Let's bow our heads, church. Let's bow our heads. As, as the worship team comes out, I just want to um, start asking you a question and so you can think, like, what is, what is your definition of greatness? What is the greatest thing? Maybe you're thinking, oh, when I graduate, that's going to be great. That's the greatest. When I find a different job, that's going to be the greatest. When I get married, that's going to be the greatest. When I get a promotion, that's going to be the greatest. Or when I travel the world or when I go to my next vacation because I want to have a great vacation and great family memories. What, what is your definition of greatness? And I'm, I'm going to pause on purpose here now. What is that? Are you so focused on that goal that people kind of became in invisible? That people kind of disappeared? Because you're so focused on yourself and your goals that people around you just became an annoyance and just became noise just became barriers to my dreams and my goals